So welcome everyone to our final talk in the ASX symposium. We're very much looking forward to this one. Uh, it looks super interesting. Uh, joining us now is Dr. Christine Krauss. Uh, Dr. Christine Krauss completed her PhD in 2004 at Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz in Germany uh, and focused on the final measurements of the Mainz neutrinos mass experiment. So this experiment set the best limit on neutrino mass for about 10 years. And following her PhD, she moved to Canada and started a postdoc at Queen's University working on Ontario's very own Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment. And after that, she started at Laurentian University as a Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in particle astrophysics. Since 2021, she's been employed by Snow Lab as a senior research scientist. Her main research focus is the SNOW Plus experiment, uh, which is a multi-purpose neutrino detector. For SNOW Plus, she is the site activity coordinator for the collaboration, which means being responsible for supervising visiting scientists and ensuring that work on the experiment is done correctly and in order. And finally, she's also a member of the HALO collaboration. So we're very excited to have Dr. Krauss here with us today. A reminder that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll be sure to direct them to Dr. Krauss throughout the talk. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Krauss, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you can see my slides now. Uh, yes. It's a pleasure to talk to you all about today. So I'll be speaking about a few things. I'll start with a tiny little bit of history about neutrinos just to set the time scale and the stage. And I'll also say a few words about Snow Lab, what this is all about. Um, and then we'll jump back in history and I'll give you an idea of what the Snow experiment was all about, which was rewarded part of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015. Uh, and I'll finish off with talking a little bit about the uh, current and future experiments, Snow Plus, and a uh, little bit about Halo. So let's go back about 100 years. Um, so this was when physicists were busy with trying to understand radioactivity in general. So roughly between 1914 and 1929, uh, people like Chadwick, Alice, also in discussions with Lisa Meitner, worked on trying to understand the beta spectrum. At this point, um, the beta spectrum was a huge surprise because it actually turned out to be a continuous spectrum where it was expected to just be a line spectrum. Uh, and below you see uh, the equation um, as we understand it today. Um, of course, they didn't know that at the time, where we know that this comes from the fact that a neutron decays into a proton by changing an up quark, a down quark into an up quark, and out comes two additional particles, an electron E minus and an electron antineutrino. And that explains why the spectrum is continuous. Uh, so here's a figure from a, an, an older paper um, that you can see. This paper is from a few years later, 1935, uh, where you can nicely see the continuous beta spectrum. Um, so at that point, people knew that there were three types of radioactivity, um, where the other two alphas and betas typically had discrete line spectrum. Um, so at this point, also remember, by 1935, that's not quite true anymore, but people didn't quite know about the neutron yet in the uh, atom either. That was 1932. So the first person who theoret theoretically determined that there should be another particle uh, was Wolfgang Pauli. Um, and he was uh, invited to speak at a meeting, uh, but didn't even bother to come. He rather went to a dance. And I'm sure some of you have seen this letter before. Uh, but he wrote that uh, to dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen, where he says, I have hit upon a desperate remedy to save the law of conservation of energy, namely the possibility that there exists in the nuclei electrically neutral particles that I call neutrons. And what he meant was the neutrino, as I said, in 1930, they didn't know about the neutron yet. He goes on to say, I agree that my remedy sh should seem incredible, but only the one who dare can win. Um, and just to underline that, unfortunately, I cannot appear in person since I'm indispensable at a ball here in Zurich. 
So uh, that was basically if you still want the birth hour of the neutrino. So the other thing to just add and set this up. So jumping forward now again, what our current understanding is. Uh, physicists or particle physics in, physicists in particular like to go with this little uh, standard uh, model of particle physics, where we now know we have six quarks uh, and only the first two, the up and down, basically form the neutrons and protons that make up all the atoms. And then we have leptons, uh, where we have the electron and then the electron neutrino. And then you can see that that gets repeated two more times in two other families. Each generation, the particles get heavier. So the other thing we need to understand, uh, everything that follows a little bit, is to look at all the forces that we are aware of. Um, and at this point, we know that there is four forces. There's the so-called electromagnetic force, uh, and this plays a role when we talk about atoms, molecules, optics, um, anything to do with electronics. This follows an inverse square law in terms of how it uh, distributes into space, and the force carrier are so-called photons, so light, if you so want. The one um, where I put the purple arrow on top that is interesting for the neutrinos is the so-called weak interaction or weak force. Uh, and that's what governs things like beta decays, and we'll keep coming back to those. And also what fuels all our suns, so solar fusion is, is um, dominated by weak interactions. So this is fairly short range, and the force carriers are so-called W and Z bosons. Then we have the strong force, and that is even shorter range, and that's basically what happens inside the nucleus, um, but also very um, interesting important for particle physics. And then the fourth one uh, that everybody thinks they know best, but in some sense we know the least about is gravity. Uh, that's what's responsible for falling objects and uh, the movements we know out there in the, in the universe, planets, orbits, stars, galaxies, also follows an inverse square law and the force carriers a graviton. So takeaway from this slide is neutrinos interact weakly. So that um, basically informs how we can go and look for them. They really only interact weakly, not with any of the other um, forces. Originally, they were built into the standard model as having no mass. We now know that this is wrong. Uh, we know neutrinos have no charge. They are neutral particles. And that will lead to some more interesting things when I uh, get to talking about SNOW+. Plus. So going back to 1930, when Mr. Bohr wrote this letter, uh, nobody could imagine how it would ever possible to be possible to detect them, and it took a while. It took until 1956, until there were the first nuclear reactors, a strong enough neutrino source to actually see them. Uh, so the other piece to the puzzle that we need to set up the story I want to tell you is, where do neutrinos come from? So what we're looking at here is on the y-axis, we have a flux, so basically how many of them um, you can see. And then on the x-axis, you have the energy range. So if we go from lowest energies to the highest energies, um, so the blue curve, the so-called cosmological neutrinos, we have no experimental access to. Uh, nobody has really measured them yet. Um, because they are so extremely low in energy, but they are left over from the Big Bang or from the, uh, the birth of the universe. So it would be really interesting if anybody ever came up with an idea of how to see them. Anything I put a yellow orangey box around, those are the ones that we can look for at Snow Lab. So their energy range goes from keV to MeV, and we're mostly talking MeV for detecting them in the types of detectors that we have at Snow Lab. So they are the neutrinos coming from the sun, so-called so solar neutrinos. There are neutrinos that can come from a supernova. Um, there are some conditions. The supernova has to be close enough, which pretty much means within our own galaxy. And that has happened once before in 1987. There are neutrinos that are coming from natural radioactivity from our own planet. Uh, those are the terrestrial anti-neutrinos, and we can detect them as well. And then there are the human-made neutrinos coming from nuclear reactors. 
And you can see there's other groups as you go further up, background from older supernovas, uh, neutrinos created in our atmosphere, uh, neutrinos from active galactic nuclei, and then cosmogenic neutrinos. And the higher you go in energy, uh, the further away they come from outside our own galaxy. So let me talk to you about Snow Lab a little bit. Snow Lab is uh, located in Canada, in Ontario. And I think most of you know that. And in an active mine, create mine in Sudbury or just outside of Sudbury, lively. And I have a few pictures there. Uh, the top left is a shot from the air of that mine site, uh, the shaft where the cage goes down in the summer. Uh, right beside it, you see a graphic of what this particular mine looks like. And we're going down number nine shaft, where we means all the material and all the people. And uh, we're going down to the uh, about 6,800 foot level or about two kilometers deep into the earth. And then we have to walk about a mile to make it to the snow lab site. On the bottom left, you see the access road in the winter. Uh, and that greenish thing on the top left, that's where the, the elevator or the cage goes down. On the bottom right, you see the snow lab surface building. And hopefully when this pandemic is over, you might have a chance to visit. And Dr. Kroos, just before you move on, we do have a question here. Sure. Um, why do we call them anti-neutrinos? Where does that uh, prefix come from? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so we're talking about both matter and antimatter. And maybe the easiest to explain this with is to take the electron since everybody is familiar with it. Uh, the, if we call the electron matter, which it is, then the antiparticle to it, an anti-electron would be a positron. So those two particles have many properties that are, that are the same. They have the same mass uh, and all the same other properties, but opposite charge. So your electron has a negative charge, the positron a positive charge. So with neutrinos, because they have no charge, it's a little bit harder to see. Um, but we still have to distinguish between neutrinos and antineutrinos to make sure that what is before the reaction and after the reaction is the same. Okay. All right, a few more pictures here. Uh, top right is just science north and that way. I think everybody who lives in Ontario has probably visited that. Um, and just another representation of um, going two kilometers deep underground. And um, we're talking, at least for the snow experiment and to some degree for snow plus two, we wanna study things like the sun. So uh, a, relative, uh, a good question is why do we go uh, deep underground to see astronomical objects? Uh, but let me start with a few more thoughts on what makes Snow Lab unique, and then I'll answer that question I just posted. Um, so Snow Lab is unique in the sense that it's very deep. Um, there's, of course, multiple underground laboratories throughout the world. It's not the deepest, but it's uh, on the very deep side. So that means um, that there's a very low muon flux or flux of um, cosmic radiation that could mimic the events that we're looking for. We're looking for very rare events in these detectors. Uh, Snow Lab is operated entirely as a clean lab. Clean technologies are also very, very important to reduce these backgrounds, and we'll come back to that. It is an active working mine, uh, which has advantages, but it also has some challenges, but we have a very good partnership with the mining company, and they maintain our access, our shaft, and, and help out with a lot of things. Um, and it has a low background environment, which is key for these types of experiments. So you see a few pictures on the right. Uh, the top one is what we call a drift. So this is what you would walk through as you try to get into the lab and you can see it's pretty dusty. The next picture is inside the lab. This particular um, hallway used to look like the top um, in the times we had the snow experiment and not yet snow lab. Um, so quite a bit of work has gone into it to make it clean. And the bottom picture is a picture of our so-called car wash. This is where things enter the lab and get appropriately cleaned. So why do we do uh, this type of science underground? So there's radiation uh, that comes from natural um, 
sources and activities. Um, they are a source of information, but they are also backgrounds. So when we do these so-called dark matter and neutrino experiments, um, we want to get away from those. So let me give you one concrete example. Uh, so when radiation hits our atmosphere and it's drawn here for, for protons, then it makes these cascades of, um, of particles. It turns into uh, pions, muons, neutrinos, all kinds of things. And you can see this starts high up, 30 kilometers uh, high up and so on. Uh, if we would build these types of experiments on the, on the surface, we still would have hundreds of thousands of muons per, per second. Um, and you can imagine that that makes it very hard to see things that are ext extremely rare. So that's why we want to have as much rock in between us and, um, and this radiation as possible. So the other part I mentioned, it's completely operated as a clean room. So why do we clean? Um, this is really a key in, ingredient to reduce their backgrounds as much as possible. And sometimes it's physical cleaning. Um, so you can see some pictures on the left-hand side here um, where we had to go into the acrylic vessel. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a, in a while. And we had to actually clean the surface. And to give you an idea of what this means is you see the person there, or maybe not, wearing gloves and being very protected. If somebody would put their, their hand, five fingerprints in on the inside of this acrylic vessel, and this thing is 12 meters in diameter, we wouldn't be able to do the physics we wanna do. It would be too much background already. So Snow Lab is a leader in ultra high precision cleaning for that reason. And here's just a few more pictures um, of cleanliness operations. This is really true for every single thing. So on the top, you see a few more pictures of material coming in that gets cleaned before it can make it into the lab. The bottom right, you see these swipe tests. We make sure there's really nothing left. On the bottom left, you see uh, um, during the construction phase, the showers, um, there's curtains now and, uh, and other things, but human beings need to be cleaned after they went through the dusty drive as well, every single time. So this is a bit of an overview of what Snow Lab looks like now. And if we start at what is circled in light blue, uh, this is the area that was used for the original snow experiment that I will be talking about. And this is now being used for the Snow Plus experiment, uh, which uses a lot of the same hardware. And there's utility drafts and, uh, and other things included there as well. Everything else is a new construction that came along with Snow Lab, which was built on the success of the snow experiment. So in the middle, you see, uh, you see these uh, hallways that look a little bit like a ladder. We call that the ladder labs. Um, and then you see two more caverns on top. Um, and there's some names spread out that you can ignore for now. I did circle in green uh, where the HALO experiment is. Um, first of all, because I also want to mention it. And second of all, this is an area where there have been preliminary studies. If there was ever more space needed, this is where you could go further if anybody would have enough money to do so. So Snow Lab has grown quite a bit. Uh, it was officially opened in 2012. Uh, and this is a figure that I took uh, from the work for the strategic plan for 2023, 2029 um, that is uh, coming up now. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how many people are involved. Um, and these numbers are a little bit outdated already again, they are from last year. 137 employees, um, I believe that's up to 170 now. There's a total of 128 institutions, uh, so that means universities and uh, research labs worldwide in a total of 23 countries. And at that point, uh, uh, we'll count at 863 users and that number probably has gone up a little bit too. Um, so that includes scientists, researchers, students, um, collaborators from across Canada and the world. Uh, Snow Lab employees also obviously include a lot of engineers, cleaner maintainers, um, human resources, all kinds of things.
So even though I'm mostly going to be talking about neutrinos, I did want to throw in two slides on dark matter. Um, because this is the other focus of the work that happens at Snow Lab. And I personally like it best to think of that uh, when we ask one of the big questions, what is the universe made of? And I'm sure some of you have seen these types of pie charts before. Um, so what we currently think we know, and you will see the numbers um, change a little bit depending on exactly what model you see, but the basic message is the same. So if we start on the top picture, there's this tiny uh, yellow slice that comes out a bit uh, that is then blown up below. So this, this tiny little yellow bit is 0.5% stars, 0.3% neutrinos, and then a factor of 10 less any of the heavier elements. But that's what, we would, what I would say we classically know as matter or think of as matter if we think about our own planet. Then there's about 4% of stuff that's kind of made out of similar things, like all the dust in between galaxies and so on. Um, but it's not very satisfactory to only know between one and 5% of um, all the matter that exists very well. So then the next big chunk is so-called dark matter. And we have a lot of indirect evidence on this, uh, which partially comes from astronomical measurements. Um, so we, we know that there has to be something. We don't know exactly what it is. Uh, as physicists or at Snow Lab, we focus on that being so-called WIMPs, where WIMPs stands for weakly interactive massive particles. And that's what we would call a direct detection search. Um, so why, why a particle? Well, a lot of things are particles. It does make sense. Uh, it should be also weakly interacting as the neutrinos are. But the neutrinos, unfortunately, so we know now they have mass, they don't have an awful lot of mass. Their mass is tiny, so it can't account for all the dark matter. They're still part of the dark matter, but they're so-called hot dark matter. So what we're looking for is things that have uh, decoupled um, a little bit later, non-relativistically, and that are heavy. Uh, there are other candidates and other searches, and what we do at Snow Lab is complementary. Uh, and I know I'm skipping a few of the indirect evidence, feel free to ask about them later. But just to give you a little bit of an idea, there's a multitude of experiments that uh, try to do this. Because basically, uh, if you go to a very basic principle, if you say, well, it has to have mass, then all you need to do is you put a pretty big target there, you make sure nothing else disturbs you, so you make it clean, you get all your backgrounds down, and then if such a thing comes by, it should bump into your target and it should make some kind of signal. And because that's very little you know, uh, different approaches are a good thing. So here's a, uh, a set of six experiments that are looking for that of various sizes um, at the moment. So let's come back to neutrinos. Uh, so neutrinos at Snow Lab um, are done by these three experiments where snow is a past one. Uh, it has been completed uh, well over 10 years ago by now. Um, so there's still some uh, PhD thesis written about the data that the experiment took. Uh, HALO is the first experiment that went online at Snow Lab in 2012 and has been consistently running since. It's a dedicated uh, supernova neutrino detector, uh, which is very neat. Uh, and then Snow Plus, and I'll tell you more about all of these in the following slides. So let's start with uh, supernova neutrinos. Neutrinos, because they are only weakly interacting and uh, don't like to interact very much and are neutral, are great messengers. Uh, they actually reach us uh, much faster than the light, um, for example, from our sun. Um, because the light bounces around inside the sun for many, many years before it comes out, neutrinos come straight out. So it turns out that most of the energy released in a supernova explosion comes in the form of neutrinos. And when I say most, I mean about 99%. So then again, we can detect them by a fairly simple principle because we're basically looking for bursts, lots of neutrinos in a very short amount of time because normally you would not see an awful lot of them. 
So this has happened once before. Uh, so the last supernova that was close enough was uh, happened in, 19, in 1987, or 1987A. It happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And uh, about 20 to 25 neutrinos were detected in uh, three different detectors that happened to be online at the time. None of them at Snow Lab because uh, Snow Lab didn't exist in 1987. Uh, one in Japan, uh, one in the US, and one in Russia. And you can see all these, uh, these events in here. All this gen generated well above 200 publications and really helped inform the models we have for how a supernova actually happens. Because for the longest time, um, theorists couldn't make supernovas explode in their models. Now they do. So as I mentioned, HALO uh, stands for Helium and Lead Observatory. It's a dedicated um, supernova neutrino detector. Um, it's made out of a recycled material. So anything in green you see are lead blocks uh, that come from Chuck River from an old cosmic ray experiment there. And they were, were repurposed. Uh, inside are uh, very sensitive counters uh, that are very sensitive to neutrons. Uh, because if supernova neutrinos hit this lead target, they will create neutrons, which can then be detected. And as I said, the principle is, is simple. You just look for a lot more than normal background in a very short amount of time, since all of these neutrinos would arrive between 10 and 30 seconds after the supernova. So within a minute or so. So normally you might see, you know, three in a day or so, if you get... Uh, 10 or 15 in, in a minute, that's pretty significant. So I do wanna next focus on the SNOW experiment. Um, as I said, SNOW Lab was built on the success of this experiment. So I think it makes sense to explain that a little bit. And I also already mentioned uh, that this was part of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015. And you have the, the sentence down there. Um, Oh, I didn't put the sentence from it. It was for the fact of realizing that uh, neutrinos oscillate and therefore have to have mass. Uh, otherwise, they couldn't change their flavors while they travel. So to summarize what SNOW has done in one sentence here is we know that these neutrinos from the sun have mass. Um, and that basically told us that we know how our sun produces energy. But let me go back and set the stage for that too. So solar neutrinos, uh, there are different types of them, but they're coming from the sun and has to do with the fusion process that happens within our own sun uh, to produce the energy. There's actually two of them. I'm only talking about the dominant one here. Um, so if we look at the graph on the right-hand side here a little bit, uh, so again, we have the neutrino flux. So how many neutrinos come from each of these steps of that process over their energy? So you can see a few line spectra for beryllium-7 and for PEP. And then you can see a few um, uh, two body decay spectra uh, where the first one, the lowest energy one is, is labeled PP, comes from the first step of the dominant process. Uh, the next one is labeled boron-8 and that's actually the one that the SNOW experiment saw. And then the as much smaller way the HEP one. Uh, so on top, there's names of experiments, and I won't explain all of them, so don't worry, uh, but that's the type of detection that has access to them. So the first two, the gallium and the chlorine one, are radiochemical experiments, so they are sensitive to lower energies, but they need a lot of patience. You basically have to have them sit there, and then once a month, you try to count single atoms, so they're very, very hard. And then super K and snow. Uh, and SNOW is the one I will be focusing on, obviously, uh, water rank of detectors. Uh, so they are only sensitive to these higher energy solar neutrinos. So what do you have to keep in mind if you're an experimentalist and you want to build one of these experiments and uh, be able to detect them? Well, you need to make your experiment big because you're detecting weakly interacting uh, particles, neutrinos. You need to get away from all the cosmic radiation. So you need to go deep. Um, and you need to make sure that all your materials have the lowest possible amount of radioactivity in it. So you want to clean. Okay, SNOW Lab does all that. 
So in these so-called water Cholenkov uh, detectors, uh, the idea there is that uh, if a neutrino comes in, it can scatter. Um, it's neutrino electron scattering that you can use there. Um, and you might be uh, more familiar with this in on the sound side um, with the sonic boom, but it does exist for light as well. It makes a so-called Cholenkov radiation cone, um, and that is something we can see. And it's drawn here for muon neutrino nanometer. Um, quick question for you, Dr. Krauss, while sure. we're talking about this. Um, did you mention that neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light? Oh, no, they don't. They, so what I, I should have been more clear on that. They travel with nearly the speed of light. If they were actually massless, they would travel with the speed of light and not experience time. But because they do have a tiny mass, they're just slightly slower. Uh, but what I was referring to, if we look at neutrinos from our sun, um, they come out more or less right away because they don't interact within the sun. But if we look at the light of our sun, it's actually probably about 10,000 years old because that's long, how long it bounces around before it comes out. So that's what I meant. Awesome. Um, Thanks. Okay, so before the snow experiment um, started, this was basically the stage. So there had been these radiochemical experiments. Um, the, which are shortened here with GA for gallium and CA for, for chlorine. And there had been uh, one water Cholenkov detector that was made with ordinary water, uh, Kamiokande, and then later Super Kamiokande or Super K. Um, so the red line in the plot here, so this is the ratio of observed events to the prediction. Uh, so the red line has all the theoretical predictions on it. And of course they are on the line because that's the but as you can see, all the experiments are kind of falling short of that quite a bit, right? Somewhere between a third and half, maybe two thirds, depending on the experiments. So this is the so-called so, uh, solar neutrino puzzle, which now has been solved. But um, obviously, people were asking questions. It existed for about 30 years. So what's going on here? Are the experiments wrong? Is the, solar, is the theory wrong? Didn't we not know what happens in our sun? Or is there something funny going on with the neutrino? Uh, so that was the stage at that point um, where the idea of Herb Chan came in, which, which ultimately led to the snow experiment. So the basic new idea here was, well, why don't we use heavy water instead of ordinary water? Uh, because there's additional neutrons in that, in that medium uh, to do that experiment. And the big advantage of this is we still have this elastic scattering that we already have seen, but then we have these two other reactions down there. Uh, so we have a neutrino that can be absorbed by a deuteron, um, so the additional neutron in the, in the heavy water. Um, and that one only happens for electron neutrinos because it has to have charged particles here um, at lowest energies. But then it also has this interesting so-called uh, neutral, uh, neutral current reaction that's right below the picture. So that's where the neutrino basically breaks up uh, deuteron and makes neutrons that we can then see. And that happens for all types of neutrinos. So what you can do with this, and that's why it's so, so such a wonderful idea is, with the neutral current, you're basically measuring the entire flux. So if there's something funny going on with the neutrinos, like they're changing their flavor while they're traveling between the time they were created and the time we detect them, this will tell you. So the main goal then for the SNOW experiment or Sudboy Neutrino Observatory was to look directly for changed neutrinos. Okay. So here's what this detector looks like. So we have a very large acrylic vessel that was constructed underground and put together. And I have a few pictures in a minute. I already mentioned it's 12 meters in diameter. And then it has this uh, neck on top, which is another seven meters high. So that's basically a six story building. Uh, that is surrounded by a steel structure, a photomultiplier support structure, where we have about 9,500 photomultipliers mounted on. And that makes for 60% coverage, which is pretty good for these types of experiments. Um, this all is enclosed in a cavern uh, that can be filled with water, ordinary water, uh, which has been cleaned. 
So there's water between the photomultipliers and the colic vessel. Uh, there's water in the rest of the cavern and you have the numbers of tons there. Um, and then inside the acrylic vessel, you have the heavy water. Oh. And we already had this one. Um, so I just want to stick with these, this neutral current reaction. So this was really the new thing. No other experiments before had been able to do this. And because of that, um, Snow actually did this three different ways. Uh, so what you see here is just capturing it right in the, in the heavy water alone. Um, in a second phase, Snow did this by adding salt, which increases the cross-section. So it, it lets you easier find all those neutrons. And then in the third phase, it inserted these, um, these counters that we have already seen that are now in the HALO experiment, um, which are super highly sensitive to neutrons. So let me show you what, this, uh, what kind of um, signal you're looking for. So these are real pictures from the experiment. This is a graphic display. Uh, people who are watching the detector 24 seven see that. And these pictures are from 1999, which is when the SNOW experiment started taking data. So a neutrino would make this nice. Uh, so imagine this as you're looking at the front of this triangle of cone that we saw. So you see this nice ring out of neutrinos. And there's about a hundred or so of these, each dot is a photomultiplier that light up. So you're looking for these rings that have on the order of a hundred, what we call hits. And just to compare that, um, you sometimes still get uh, higher energy neutrinos coming from the atmosphere. They light up a lot more, higher energy. Uh, muons also look uh, much more like that. So it turned out that this idea was a wonderful one. And it worked out quite, uh, quite nicely. So because um, we have this charge current um, reaction that only is sensitive to electron neutrinos and the neutral current reaction that's sensitive to all flavors equally. So let's look at this uh, picture again after Snow had taken data. Um, so you still see the gallium and chlorine experiments down there and the super key ones. And then if you only take the charge current or elastic scattering ones for Snow, they confirm what the other triangle detectors have seen. So if we're only looking for electron neutrinos, that's not all. Um, but if we're looking at the whole flux and you see that on top with the green neutral current one, um, then it nicely fits with the theory. So we've now clearly demonstrated that some of them change flavor. So here's one of the later plots um, after the other two phases had been um, completed as well, which summarizes this very nicely. Um, and if we just read the bottom line here, SNOW provided the first direct observation of neutrino flavor transformation. Um, and that clearly tells us that neutrinos do have mass. Okay, so I told you I'll show you a few construction pictures. So on the left here, you see this uh, steel structure that will hold the photomultipliers as it's constructed on surface and gives you a bit of an idea of how big this actually is. On the right-hand side, you see the cavern before it was, uh, the liner was put in and all the material was put in. Um, then this was constructed the top half first, um, both for the support structure and then the acrylic vessel. Then it was raised up. Um, here you can already see the acrylic vessel completed and the photomultipliers in the top. You can see the liner on the walls. Here's the detector completely completed and closed up. And then a picture taken in between with the cameras. Uh, so these are some old pictures of what the access to the lab looked like at that time. What it looked like inside the lab. And I think most of you can tell from the computers that those are pretty old pictures. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see the, uh, the plastic piping that would transport the heavy water and help it circulate and clean it up and purify it. Uh, the heavy water, by the way, was uh, on loan from the government of Canada for about uh, $1, uh, but it cost about a million dollars of insurance every year. All right, so SNOW, as I said, was a huge success. And I just wanna repeat, neutrinos are great messengers and that's why we're so interested in looking further at them. 
Um, they don't interact much. They travel nearly with the speed of light. And therefore, they can teach us a lot about the universe. Uh, and I mentioned it verbally, but here you have the same thing in pictures. So here's a picture of our sun, and they are taking from the NASA web page. On the right hand side, just an ordinary picture in light. On the left hand side, a picture in neutrinos of our own sun. All right, so let me move ahead with the current experiments um, and what SNOW Plus is interested in. And one of the things SNOW Plus is really interested in is the so called neutrinoless double beta decay. So I told you we're uh, sticking with the beta decay, but this one is a little bit more complicated. Um, so why is this interesting? Uh, well, there's new physics there. We're still looking for answers to the big questions. Um, so we know our universe is made out of mostly matter and not antimatter. And a good question to ask is why? Right. Um, we know that the neutrino has to have a mass, but we still don't quite know what exactly that mass is. So what is the mass of the neutrino? And then what we can access with this particular search is the question, is the neutrino different from the antineutrino? And this is really interesting because anytime we're having a broken symmetry, there are interesting new discoveries in physics coming out of it. So if we go back to the very beginning on the left-hand side, I'm showing you an ordinary beta, beta decay again. And this particular one is for carbon 14. Uh, so we get a new element, we get an antineutrino, and we get an electron out. So now it turns out that for some elements, um, this is just not the best choice energetically. So they are, uh, they are, the beta decay might be forbidden or highly suppressed for them. And for the small selection of, um, of elements, there's only 30 some of them, then you can kind of have um, two beta decays in parallel, and that's what we call double beta decay. Uh, so that's what's drawn on the, on the right-hand picture on the left. So then we would have two electrons and two antineutrinos coming out. So now it, it gets interesting. So let's say the neutrino was its own antiparticle. We call that a Majorana particle. That would violate the lepton number. So we wouldn't have the same number of leptons before we start and after we start. It would be uh, violated by the number two. Because what then could happen if the, if the particle was its own antiparticle is that we don't get any neutrinos out. That they kind of cancel each other out. And that's not technically 100% correct, but uh, enough for the idea. So we only get two electrons coming up. So that's something we can look for experimentally. So let's look at what we are actually looking for uh, there. So I put the same single beta spectrum again that I showed you from the 1930s. The double beta decay uh, looks very similar. It also is a, is a two body decay spectrum. But then if this neutrinoless version would exist, we would have like an additional little tiny little bump at the end point there. So in order to look for something like that, we would want pretty good energy resolution and high statistics, or at least one of them. So that's hard, right? We already, I already told you we're looking for extremely rare things. And the little box in the right-hand plot shows how that really looks like because it's not that nicely separated, right? So we're, we're looking for a little bit of an access very close to where you have the lowest count rate. So that's one of the things we wanna do with SNOW Plus. Um, and this should look familiar now. So we still use the same acrylic vessel, but instead of all the heavy water has been given back to the government, um, we now put uh, what we call in a liquid scintillator in there, which is basically a mineral oil comes with a problem because this mineral oil is less dense than water. Um, so the whole thing wants to float up. So we had to install an additional rope net to anchor it to the floor so it won't destroy itself. The photomultipliers are still all the same. There's about 800 that broke throughout the lifetime of snow that we removed, repaired and put back. Um, but other than that, not too much changed. Snow Plus has a very broad physics program. Uh, and I won't go through every single thing here. I already told you about the neutrino less double beta decay. But we can also see neutrinos from a supernova um, should one happen in our galaxy. 
And we can also see neutrinos coming from, uh, from the inside of our Earth. So we're also looking for anti-neutrinos. So here's a picture of the plants that we use to purify the scintillator. And you have the name here. Uh, we're using uh, linear acrylbenzene or LAB. Uh, and the advantage of using the scintillator is that you can make it cleaner, so lower backgrounds. And for each reaction, it puts out more light. So that means you can look for things with lower energies. So now a little bit of, um, of history here. Um, so we filled this first with ordinary water and then the scintillator came in from top and replacing the water. And that process took some time. Uh, so we started in November, 2018. It was finally full by April, 2020. Uh, the last little bit of delay was due to the pandemic. Um, it gave us a nice six month measurement period at 47%, looking at our backgrounds. Um, but we now are full of scintillator. So the element of choice for us to look for this neutrino, this double beta decay is tellurium 130, which has a fairly high endpoint. So you stay away from some of the low energy backgrounds. It has a very nice high natural abundance. So you don't have to actually um, enrich it. Um, but you're seeing that, so this, uh, the, the half-life for the two neutrino version is already 10 to the 20 years. So we're really looking for where things, the neutrino less one is even longer left. Um, but those are the plants that will purify uh, the tellurium compound that gets loaded into it. Uh, and without going into too much detail, but just to give you an idea, uh, let's just look at the pie chart here. Uh, so this is what we think we can allow for backgrounds so we can see our signal. And you can see half of it comes from the solar neutrinos that uh, Snow was um, basically built on. That's now our highest, highest background contribution. The gray bar is what comes from the big uh, hill of two neutrino double beta decay. Um, and then uh, everything else is kind of what comes from um, external material that we can get rid of. And those we already measured. I uh, will skip this one in interest of time. And uh, this just again summarizes what we're looking for here in terms of backgrounds. And um, I think I am pretty close to the end of my time. So I'll stop here with the picture of the Snow Plus collaboration that was taken in 2019. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kroos. That was super interesting. And we actually have a ton of questions here in the chat. So that was great. You left a bit of time there. Um, maybe starting off, someone's asking here, uh, does recycling old parts from previous experiments have an effect on the accuracy or precision of new experiments? Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, no. Uh, so the, the lead is, you know, just sits there. Uh, it was painted with that uh, green paint, mostly to keep it clean enough for the clean room and to preserve it further. Because lead turns out it's actually fairly soft. Uh, so one of the st early studies was how much of that can you actually uh, put on top of each other without it squishing and melting away. Uh, and these, um, the helium three counters, um, they, they have been, they get checked regularly and they're still working just fine. So yes, it, stuff can age at some point, but so far it hasn't been a problem. Great. And a question that's a bit different here actually is, um, you mentioned that there were three types of neutrinos, uh, neutrino flavors mm -hmm. or species, um, but I've heard, I don't know if this is true or not, but there is a potentially a fourth species of neutrino that is yeah. maybe the sterile neutrino? Yeah, that's I... right. So there, there are people who think there might be more. Um, it could be a fourth or there could be more than one extra family. And sterile neutrinos is the expression uh, that's used for it. There are experiments that are looking for that. And it comes from studying carefully how one type changes into another. And there are some anom anomalies in some of them. There's a little extra bump, which you know could be just statistics or not. Uh, so people are trying to look for this very carefully. So far, nobody has seen any, but it's still a pretty big topic to look for so-called sterile neutrinos. So where are these supposed to come from? Uh, so I think that would be another new physics thing. So mm. the, the, it would be something new again. Cool. Exciting. Um, so another question here is uh, you talked a lot about working in the mine and how the mine is set up. Um, 
what are some quirks of working in such a deep mine? So maybe one of your favorite or least favorite parts of working uh, so far underground. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, might not be clear to everybody is two kilometers deep underground, it's actually pretty warm. Uh, so naturally, the rock at, the, uh, at that depth has about 40 degrees Celsius um, through the ventilation in the mine, because it's been on for a very long time. It's cooled down to, you know, let's say about 30, uh, but it's pretty warm down there. Uh, so I am every time very happy that I just have to walk through the drift and not spend 10 hours working hard like the miners do. Um, this particular mine, they now actually explore down to another... 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 feet deeper, and that problem just gets worse. So uh, that's, an, that's an interesting side effect. So I, I understand that the miners that work at these lowest levels actually take many weeks and months to get used to it and have to drink a lot and have very good air conditioning in their refuge stations. Wow. Yeah, and, especially in the know, summer. Anything you need, you want it underground, because one of the worst things is you just need this one screw to finish the thing, but it's on surface, surface is very far away. So we store all the things that you need all the time underground. Wow. Uh, another question we have here, uh, what are some properties we look for when selecting the element uh, to actually detect neutrinos? Mm -hmm. uh, so I assume that's related to the neutrinos double beta decay. Um, so I alluded to it a little bit in the properties. Um, so looking at the energies, you want the endpoint to be as high as possible because the lower the go, the more stuff you have uh, covering it up. So uh, the harder it gets to separate it out from, from everything else. The natural abundance one is another one. So some of these elements, their natural abundance is like super low. Uh, one of these examples is xenon, uh, which is a very good candidate because it's a noble gas, so it's great to work with, but you have to enrich it. And to build the experiments and the size we need them, we need them to be big, right? Because they're super rare events. You basically would buy the world's market of a year or two's worth of xenon need for one of these experiments. So you have to actually think about those types of things. Is there even enough xenon around to do it? Right. And we have a couple minutes here, so maybe we can end um, this portion here with this question, which is saying, uh, if you're interested in working with Snow Lab, what are some topics to study or things that you could do if you're interested uh, to get into that organization or field? Mm -hmm. um, so as undergrad students, we have a lot of students jobs in the summer. Uh, that's a great way to get involved. Um, and they go through all departments. So people with engineering background, we have a lot of them because uh, we need to operate these plants, chemical engineers, we need to build things. Uh, we have tradespeople. Um, we have, um, you know, we use mathematicians, computer scientists for simulations, uh, if you're interested in more on the, of the experiments. Uh, there are some life science experiments at Snow Lab too. So there are people with biology background that might have interest as well. Um, the Snow Lab web page has uh, good information about student opportunities and other job opportunities, uh, but that's pretty much reach out to any time. Um, we do do tours when there's not a pandemic uh, for people who are interested to just take a look. That's also possible. If your organization wants to come up for a tour anytime, reach out after the pandemic. <laughs> So uh, the bottom line is it's not just, you don't need just an astronomy background. There's lots of opportunities, mm -hmm. lots multidisciplinary. Of opportunities. Yeah. Cool. Super exciting. Well, your talk was so good that you've already got people, yeah, looking, lined up to come to Snow Lab. So um, yep. that's awesome. But I guess um, if there's no more questions, we're kind of ending right on time here. Um, yeah, we're also I always looking for partnerships, right? I mean, this whole idea of using multiple different instruments and combining the analysis is getting bigger and bigger, and we're always open for ideas. So exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Krauss, for taking your time and talking to us about particle physics. Super interesting and very different than the other talks we've seen so far. So we really appreciate you coming out and uh, letting us learn from you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you so much. Amazing talk. And what a way to end it. What a way to end the 18th Astronomy uh, and Space Exploration Society's uh, symposium. 
we have a couple closing remarks. So Dr. Krauss, you're feel, uh, feel free to go if you have something to do um, that we're, we're just gonna run through some of those, but thank you again. Okay, awesome. So yeah, just like I said, we've made it to the end here. Three days of talks and workshops and panels uh, covering a whole wide array of really different um, uh, topics. So throughout this, uh, you know, these, this event, we really hope that you've uh, learned more about just how vast and how large and, you know, diverse of a field observational astronomy is. Uh, we hope that you've, you know, used the panel to understand more about how, um, when we go forward with observational astronomy, uh, how we incorporate, you know, more diversity and inclusion in STEM, um, and incorporate more conversations over land and um, the telescopes we build on it. Um, and of course, this event could not have been possible without all of the speakers uh, that joined us so far. So a very uh, big thank you to the excellent speakers and scientists that we got to hear from. Uh, truly amazing. Uh, all of their biographies can be found on the website as well. So that asxsociety.com. And if you want to check out any of these recorded talks, I know there was interest in that or showing it to classes or whatnot. Uh, all of the ones that uh, granted permission to be recorded will be uploaded on the ASX YouTube page soon. So that's also very exciting. Um, excellent. There's, you know, of course, on the website, other initiatives to check out too. As mentioned in the panel discussion yesterday, we're going to be uploading some resources um, to uh, support Indigenous communities and underrepresented groups in STEM. Uh, so truly, there is a lot on that website. Please check it out for more information. Um, yeah, excellent. Yeah, perfect. There's the link in the chat. Uh, we also have some more thank yous here, I think, on the next slide. Um, yeah, so again, we have some great panelists, great talks. Um, but also a huge thank you here just to the ASX um, itself for putting this event on. Uh, I know that it was many months of planning uh, that went into this, so I think it was a very successful uh, event. And uh, a couple of shout outs here to the people that did this. Uh, the symposium directors, Jay and Ryan, uh, they organized all of the events, coordinated the speakers for you all, uh, came up with some of uh, the format, the talks, everything like that. and. Um, Huge congratulations to them for such an, a successful event. Uh, of course, uh, Julie here, the president of ASX, handled so many logistics, uh, juggled so many you know, teams behind the scenes and got things ready. So of course, could not have done it without her, uh, as well as the graphic designers, Janine and Victoria, absolutely beautiful slides and uh, 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 posts on social media. So great job. Uh, of course, getting people to come to this. Adam, the outreach direct, uh, director, super great job. Uh, awesome commercial that was put out there. So that was super fun. Um, we also got to hear from Katarina, the vice president. Uh, she did a lot of logistical stuff here and also managed to give a talk about astrophotography. So truly an amazing person. Uh, the webmaster, Caleb, designing the website. Uh, Ava, the secretary, just keeping everyone organized. And of course, uh, just the rest of the ASX team for, you know, constant support and help throughout this event. Um, also like to shout out our wonderful moderator and MC Stephanie, who helped us so much with this event. She took time, uh, she took time out of her own observation time to come here and help us run the event. So from the entire ASX team, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Ryan. That's really nice. Yeah, happy to do it. Happy to be here. Great fun. Um, okay, I think we have another slide here. Just once again, thanking uh, the sponsors that also made this event possible. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about any of these uh, businesses or organizations, again, uh, sending you back to that ASX website, which has all of that information for you there. Um, and of course, a big thank you to everyone in the audience that joined us over the last couple of days. Uh, we understand that online events are very difficult right now. Uh, there is a lot of Zoom fatigue, we feel that, so uh, we're very happy and uh, excited that you all came out and asked such engaging questions and really showed a lot of interest in uh, learning about astronomy and, you know, uh, the future of astronomy, so thank you to all of you as well. 
Um, Julie, I don't know if you want to talk about the raffle here. I think maybe people might be eager to hear about that. Oh, maybe Julie's not here. Ryan, do you want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so we have a raffle draw uh, where tickets were uh, available for sale and we have three amazing prizes. So our first prize is a space mug that comes in a variety of colors. We have navy shown there, baby blue, pink or white. And we also have a constellation notebook and an ASX sweater. So the raffle draw will take place later today and our winner for all of these prices will be contacted by an email. So please uh, look out for that. Exciting. Always fun to win something. Um, okay. And I guess with our last slide here again, um, providing some contact info, uh, that is the end of the 18th annual ASX symposium. So we hope that you'll be back for next year's symposium. Fingers crossed that it will be in person uh, 2023, hopefully. Um, but in the meantime, you should definitely, definitely follow um, the ASX on their social media and keep checking their websites um, because they host a ton of events, not just a symposium, but more talks, trivia nights, hackathons. Um, so truly, if you really do want to keep learning about astronomy, the ASX is a great way to do it. Um, and you can feel free to sign up for a monthly newsletter they have as well by just sending them an email there at that space society at student.utoronto.ca. So thank you again, everyone. If I'm missing anything, uh, ASX, feel free to chime in. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I guess, go and enjoy your weekends or what's left of them and uh, hope to see you at more ASX events in the future. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>